from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm here now to introduce Joe Hayes, and I wish I could do it bilingually, since Mr. Hayes has made a career of bridging, cult bridging, bridging cultures with his tales from the Hispanic, Native American, and Anglo traditions. Mr. Hayes grew up in Arizona, about 50 miles from the Mexico border. As an adult, his knowledge of Spanish helped him find work doing, doing mineral exploration in Mexico and Spain. He soon moved to New Mexico, where he started teaching high school English and gathering up and sharing the folklore of the region. He began by telling stories to his own children and then expanded his audience with extensive traveling and such books as A Spoon for Every Bite, Everyone Knows Gato Pinto, Ghost Fever, and my favorite, The Day It Snowed Tortillas. His latest book is called The Coyote Under the Table. Mr. Hayes has won many awards for his storytelling performances, and I will not keep you from him and his storytelling any longer. Please welcome Joe Hayes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. That was great. And yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you stories. I like to write the stories, and then they can be in a book. And if I don't get a chance to tell the stories, then people can read them from the book. But what I like to do is keep as many stories as I can in my mind so that when I am lucky and I get to be with people, I just like to tell the stories. And when I tell the stories, you can create them, make the story happen in your imagination. Everybody sees a little different story. Everybody has a different imagination. And I do like to tell stories with Spanish in them. And it's true, when I was a kid, I had friends who knew Spanish, and I used to get them to teach me how to say things in Spanish. I learned a lot of Spanish from my friends. If you're going to try that, I better warn you about something. They might trick you. Sometimes that would happen to me. My friends would teach me something in Spanish, and they would say, this is what it means in English. It didn't really mean that. I can remember there was a time when my friend said to me, oh, our teacher is so nice. You should say this to her. This means I really like you. You know what he told me to say to the teacher? He said, you should tell her, callate la boca. And I said, do you know what it means? It means shut your mouth. I said it to my teacher. I went to my teacher with a big smile on my face, and I said, callate la boca. She knew what it meant. And she told me, you need to be more careful. You might say something one of these days that's really embarrassing. I started to check up on my friends, and they couldn't trick me so easily. I remember another time, I thought my friend had tricked me, but then it turned out he hadn't. One time, we were together, we were eating in a little cafe, and I was opening up one of those little paper packages with salt in it. And I said to my friend, how do you say salt in Spanish? He said, sal. I thought, oh, that's great. How do you say, pass me the salt? He said, you just say, pasame la sal. And I thought, that sounds like, pass me the salt. Pasame la sal. But one day I was going down the street in our little town. I was going past the house of a little old lady. She had a really pretty yard around her house. She had a pomegranate bush in her yard. Sometimes kids would sneak into that yard and steal a pomegranate. I saw a kid that day. He was creeping into the yard. I knew he was going to grab a pomegranate. All of a sudden, the door of the house opened up, and the old lady came outside. She said, Oye, sal, sal, de, sal. I said to myself, why is she hollering about salt? <laughs> and I went back to my friend and said, did you trick me? You told me that sal means salt. But I saw that old lady chase a kid out of her yard. She kept telling him, sal, salte, sal. And my friend told me, oh, sal means something else, too. It also means get out. 
If you tell somebody, sal, you're saying, get out. If you talk about something white you put on your food to make it taste a little bit better, and you say, sal, that's salt. And then I learned the story that has both meanings of the word sal. And this story happened one time when a woman was going to make a meal for her family. She got out the pots and the pans. Oh, they didn't have a lot of money. She was going to make a simple meal. She was going to cook up some, do you know this word? Frijoles. Have you ever been to a Mexican restaurant? Have you had frijoles? What is it? Yeah, you had some beans, didn't you? She was going to make some arroz. You know that word? Some rice. A little bit of pollo. Some chicken. She was going to boil up some chicken and make some beans and some rice. Just a simple meal, but she was going to make it taste good with some good spices. But then the woman opened up the cupboard and she realized she didn't have any salt. There wasn't even a pinch of salt in the whole house. And everybody knows if you want to cook good food, you have to have a little bit of salt. So the woman went outside and she called to her little boy. He was kicking pebbles up and down the street. And she told her little boy, Corre a la tienda, comprame sal. Run down to the store, she said. Buy me some salt. And she gave him a little bit of money. He put the money in his pocket. He started running down the street. His mom shouted after him. His mom said, don't forget what I need. Comprame sal. Buy me some salt. Well, the little boy didn't want to forget what he was supposed to buy for his mom. So he started saying the word to himself over and over as he went running down the street. He said, sal, 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 sal. But then he tripped over a crack in the sidewalk. He fell down and he banged his knee on the cement. The poor little boy sat there holding his leg. He was choking back the tears and then he got up to run again, but he couldn't remember the word he had been saying. La palabra se le había escapado de la mente en la caída. When he fell down, the word went right out of his mind. But then the little boy noticed the door of a neighbor's house was open. So he thought he would go to the neighbor's house and see if they could help him. He ran over to the house and he poked his head in through the door. Just when the little boy poked his head into the neighbor's house, the neighbor's teenage daughter was in there. Estaba despidiendo su novio con un beso. She was kissing her boyfriend goodbye. The teenager saw the little boy stick his head in the door. They said, niño entrometido, you nosy little boy. Sal, sal. What were they telling him when they said, Sal, get out of here. But what was he supposed to buy for his mom? The little boy said, Sal. When the teenagers heard that, they thought the little boy was making fun of them. The teenage boy walked over and he grabbed the little boy by the arm and he gave him a shaking. And then he told the little boy, no metas tu nariz. Mind your own business, he told him. Don't stick your nose. That's nariz. 
Don't stick your nose into other people's business. No metas tu nariz. Mind your own business. He let the boy go, and the boy ran away from that house as fast as he could, and then he slowed down, and he wanted to remember what he had been saying. But the only thing that came into his mind was the last thing he heard. No metas tu nariz. Mind your own business. So the boy started running on down the street saying it over and over. No metas tu nariz. Mind your own business. No metas tu nariz. Mind your own business. On the corner of the street, two men were arguing about something, and then they started shouting at each other. One of the men even reached out and grabbed the other man by the front of his shirt. A policeman was hurrying towards those two men to make sure they didn't start fighting. And when the policeman passed the little boy, he heard the little boy say, No metas tu nariz, mind your own business. El policía se enojó. It made the policeman mad. He reached down and grabbed the little boy by the arm, and he pulled the boy along with him. And the policeman separated the two men who were arguing. And then he said to the little boy, that's not what you should say to somebody who is trying to prevent a fight. You should have said, que se separen pronto. May they break it up right away. The policeman let the boy go, and the boy ran away as fast as he could, and then he slowed down, and he wanted to remember what he had been saying, but the only thing that came into his mind was the last thing he heard. Que se separen pronto. May they break up right away. He went down the street saying it over and over again. Que se separen pronto. May they break up right away. En la otra cuadra había una iglesia. Una boda estaba por terminar en la iglesia. In the next block, there was a church. A wedding was just ending at the church. The bride and the groom were coming out the door of the church hand in hand with big smiles on their faces. And the boy came down the street saying, Que se separen pronto. May they break up right away. The newlyweds were offended. The groom walked over to the boy and said, That's a terrible thing to say at my wedding. You should be wishing us many happy years together. Remember, más vale dos juntos que uno solo. Two together is better than one. He meant two people who are happily married are going to be better off than somebody who's all alone and lonely. He let the boy go, and the boy ran away from the church. See if you can get this. Quería recordar lo que estaba diciendo, pero lo único que le vino a la mente fue lo último que había oído. He wanted to remember what he had been saying. All that came to his mind was the last thing he heard. Más vale dos juntos que uno solo. Two together is better than one. He went running down the street saying it over and over again. Más vale dos juntos que uno solo. Two together is better than one. Un poco más allá de la iglesia había un cementerio. Just beyond the church, there was a cemetery. A funeral was just going into the cemetery. 
all of the dead man's relatives and friends were walking behind the coffin. They were crying and wiping their eyes. And the boy came running down the street saying, Más vale dos juntos que uno solo. Two together is better than one. They thought he was saying it would be better if two people had died. One of the mourners from the funeral went over to the boy and said, Oh, don't say that. It's sad enough that we have lost one of our friends. How can you say it would be better if it had been two of them? At a funeral, you're supposed to say, Que descanse en paz para siempre. May he rest there in peace forever. He let the boy go, and the boy ran away. Y luego quería recordar lo que estaba diciendo, pero lo único que le vino a la mente fue lo último que había oído. Which means what? All he could remember was the last thing he heard. Que descanse y en paz para siempre. May he rest there in peace forever. Se fue corriendo por la calle repitiéndolo. Que descanse y en paz para siempre. May he rest there in peace forever. At the end of that street, there was a park with a well in it. A man who came to the well to get some water had dropped his bucket into the well. His friend tried to help him get the bucket out of the well. Y los dos se cayeron a la noria. They both fell into the well. Finally, one of the men had managed to climb out of the well. The other man was still down in the well, screaming for help. And the boy came along saying, Que descanse y en paz para siempre. May he rest there in peace forever. The man who had gotten out of the well heard him. He said, stop saying that. Es mi amigo en la noria. You know what amigo means, don't you? That is my friend in the well. I have to get him out of there. And he made the little boy help him. Finally, they got the second man out of the well. And then the first man told the little boy, you should have said, ya salió uno, saquemos al otro. One is already out, let's get the other one out. He was talking about himself and his friend. He let the boy go. El niño se fue corriendo y luego quería recordar lo que yo estaba diciendo. Lo único que le vino a la mente fue lo último que vi oído. All he could remember was the last thing he heard. Ya salió uno, saquemos al otro. One is already out. Let's get the other one out. He went down the street saying it again and again. Ya salió uno, saquemos al otro. One is already out. Let's get the other one out. Ay, con quien más en el mundo se va a encontrar que con un hombre con un solo ojo. Who in the world should he meet up with but with a man who only had one eye? And the boy was saying, ya salió uno, saquemos al otro. One is already out. Let's get the other one out. The man said, that is an outrageous thing to say to me. If you have to say anything at all, you should say, gracias a Dios que le queda uno. Thank God you still have one left. He let the boy go and the boy ran and he ran from the man. All he could remember was the last thing he heard. Gracias a Dios que le queda uno. Thank God you still have one left. He went down the street saying it again and again. Gracias a Dios que le queda uno. Thank God you still have one left. The next house he came to had chickens in the yard. But dogs had gotten into the yard. 
La señora de la casa estaba sacando los perros a escobazos. The lady who lived in that house was chasing the dogs out of her yard with a broom. But there was one little dog. Había un perrito muy vivo. There was a quick little dog. He kept jumping around her broom. She couldn't get that last dog out of the yard. And the boy came down the street saying, Gracias a Dios que le queda uno. Thank God you still have one left. The woman said, What are you saying? I must get this dog out of my yard. He might kill my chickens. And she told the little boy, Ven acá, ayúdame. You get over here, she said. Help me. Corre detrás del perrito. You run along behind that dog. Grítale. You holler at that dog. What do you think she's going to tell him to say to the dog? You tell that dog, sal, sal, sal. The little boy stopped right there in his tracks. He said, sal. Y se fue corriendo a toda carrera. He ran down the street as fast as he could. Finally, he got to the store. He bought a little bit of salt. He took it home to his mom. And his mom said, Gracias, hijo mío. Everybody knows what gracias means, don't you? Thank you. She said, Did you have any trouble along the way? The little boy said, Mom, I had a lot of trouble. Dime, mami, ¿por qué se enoja tan fácil la gente? Tell me, mom, he said, why do people get mad so easily? His mom laughed at him. She said, la gente no se enoja fácil. People don't get mad easily, she said. Now go on outside and play. Sal a jugar, sal. That little boy plugged his ears. He said, Ay, por favor, mami, no vuelvas a decir esa palabra. Please, mom, he said, don't say that word again. And he ran out of the house, and his mom never did find out why her little boy couldn't stand to hear the word sad. But you know why, don't you? No. Thank you. That poor little boy, everything he said was the worst thing he could say to the person he met up with. But do you know what? That's the best thing about the story because it makes it the easiest story in the world to tell. That story has built in automatic memory. Anybody can tell it. If you remember what he's saying, you're going to remember who he meets. When you remember who he meets, you're going to remember what they tell him to say. But do you know the first rule of storytelling? The first rule of storytelling is this. When you hear a new story, tell it to somebody before the sun comes up again the next day. You got to find somebody and tell them that story right away. You got to prove to yourself you can get from the beginning of the story to the end of the story. After the first time, then you can calm down and have fun telling the story. You got to do it one time and you got to do it right away. So that's going to be your assignment before the sun comes up tomorrow morning. You got to find somebody to tell that story to. Have you noticed we've been hearing or getting the stories in sign the whole time too? I always like to work with signers. I think it adds so much to a story when you can hear it and also see it being signed. It's a lot of fun to see how it comes out in sign. I used to be very fortunate. I used to get to work frequently with a signer named Rose Sanchez. And we used to work together and she would sign the stories while I was telling them. 
and it was always a lot of fun for me. I think I, I think I'm going to tell a story that we had a lot of fun with when we used to work together. It's going to be a Pueblo Indian story, a Pueblo story from New Mexico. And it's going to be a story about an evil giant, an evil giant. He lived in a cave up in the mountains. It wasn't very far from an Indian Pueblo, from an Indian village. One day, just at noon, the people in the village heard the giant coming toward them. And they heard the giant singing. He was singing like this. Think I want to eat some good corn. Think I want to eat some good corn. That was his whole song. He just said the same thing over and over. Think I want to eat some good corn. Oh, that song is so simple that my friend Rose, she said to me one time, why don't you learn how to do the song in sign? It would make it a little bit more interesting. I didn't want to. She said, I mean, I said to her, I'm, I'm not very good at things like that. She said, oh, a lot of sign is very logical. It makes a lot of sense. I told her, show me the words in the song. She taught me how to say think. Can you show us? Oh, what? Doesn't that make sense? Think. Try that. Put your finger to your head. You're saying a word. Think. How do you say I? Just point to yourself. Isn't that easy? Think I. Want. Ooh, like you're grabbing something for yourself. Think I want. To eat. Oh, just pretend you're eating. To eat. How would you say some? See, like you're slicing some off. Slice one hand across the other. Some good corn. Like you're eating some corn on the cob. Let's see if you can put the whole song together. Think I want to eat some good corn. When the people heard the song, they said, listen, he's asking for our corn. We better give it to him. If we don't, he might knock our houses down. They got out all the corn they had harvested from their fields that year. They took it to the giant. He filled up the big basket he had on his back. When he had filled up his basket, he took all the corn they had in the village, and he went away. The people said, oh, no. He took all our corn. Oh, well, at least he didn't knock our village down. But then the next day, just at noon, the giant came back again. And he was singing, think I want to eat some melons, melons. Oh, look at that. Go like that, like you're popping a watermelon to find out if it's ripe. Pop the back of your hand. Melons. Do you remember the rest of the song? Let's do it. Think I want to eat some melons. The people got out all the melons they had picked from their gardens. They took them to the giant. He filled up the basket on his back. He took all the melons they had in the village. He went away. And then the next day, he came back again, and he was singing, Think I want to eat some deer meat. Deer. Oh, look, you put antlers on your head. Deer. Meat. 
So the song is going to be Think I Want to Eat Some Deer Meat. See if you can go a little bit faster. Sort of like it's really a song. We'll speed it up a little bit. Think I want to eat some deer meat. Ooh, the hunters had been lucky that year. They had killed many deer. The people got out all the dry deer meat they were storing for the winter. They took it to the giant, and he filled the basket on his back. He took all the meat they had in the village. The people said, oh, we'll be hungry this year. He has taken all our food. Oh, well, at least there's nothing else he can ask for now. But the next day, just at noon, the giant came back again, and uh, he was singing, Think I want to eat some children. Ooh, let's do that song. Think I want to eat some children. The people said, listen, he's asking for our children. What can we do? Their medicine chief told them, we must pray. We will ask our mother to send us a good giant to protect us from this evil one. And the medicine chief got out a perfect ear of corn that he had hidden away. That's an ear of corn without a single grain missing, clear down to the point. He put it on the ground. He covered it with a large white cloth. And then he began to play his drum and sing a magical chant and as he was chanting, something started moving under the cloth. It got bigger and bigger until a giant had grown up under the cloth. The giant threw the cloth aside. He said, what have I been made for? The medicine chief told him, you were sent to us by our mother to protect us from an evil giant who wants to eat our children. The good giant nodded his head. He looked around and he saw that the evil giant was still coming toward the Pueblo. He was still singing, think I want to eat some children. The good giant stood up. He sang back to the evil giant. He sang like this. You're not going to eat these children. You're not going to eat these children. When the evil giant heard him, he stopped right there in his tracks. And he sang, who thinks he can tell me that? Who thinks he can tell me that? And the good giant sang, I'll tell you whatever I want to. I'll tell you whatever I want to. And then the evil giant challenged the good giant to a fight. The medicine chief took 
cornmeal. He made a trail on the ground with cornmeal, and he led the good giant out of the village and over to where the evil giant was waiting. The evil giant had a heavy war club in his hand. The good giant had a long stone knife in his belt. And the good giant said, you are evil. I am good. You hit first. Hit me four times. Then if I can, I will hit you. The evil giant swung his war club, but it bounced right back so fast it almost flew right out of his hand. The good giant wasn't hurt at all. The evil giant swung his club a second time. There was a loud cracking sound, but it was the wood of the club that was cracking. It wasn't the good giant's head. The evil giant swung his club a third time, and the club split the whole way down the middle. And then the fourth time he struck with his club, his club shattered into splinters. And then the good giant drew his long stone knife he struck with it just once, and the evil giant was split wide open. The people all ran up to the giant. They looked inside. This is what they saw. The giant's heart was filled with cactus needles and thorns. That's what made him act so evil. The medicine chief removed all the thorns and all the cactus from the giant's heart, and then he filled his heart with beautiful blue turquoise stones and with pink quartz crystals. And then he closed him back up again. He made a trail with cornmeal, and he led the good giant back into the village. He covered him with the same white cloth, and he sang until he turned back into a perfect ear of corn. And then with another trail of cornmeal, he led the evil giant back to his cave in the mountains. But since his heart had been changed, and it didn't hurt him anymore. He never came back to bother the people of the village again. Except for when the children of the village aren't behaving themselves. If that should begin to happen, the medicine chief will go to the mountains and talk to the giant the next day just at noon, you can see the giant walking toward the pueblo. He's singing to himself. You know what he's saying, don't you? Think I want to eat some children. He gives the children a scare, and they start to behave themselves again. They say the children in that village are just about the best behaved children in any village anywhere. I can see why, can't you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your help. That was wonderful. Thank you. That was fun. Well, I only have about six or seven minutes left. So I better finish up with the story of the gum chewing rattler. That'll finish. Do any of the kids here like to chew bubble gum? Oh, then I will. You'll relate to this story then. Oh, if you like to chew bubble gum, I bet I know what you do. 
You probably get a piece of bubble gum and you unwrap it, you stick it in your mouth, and you chew it. That's not what I would do when I was a kid. I would put two or three pieces of bubble gum in my mouth at the same time. I might even put five or six pieces of bubble gum all in my mouth at once. I would be chomping away on a big juicy wad of bubble gum all the time. Even when I was in school, my teacher would see that. And my teacher would say, get rid of that gum. I had to take the bubble gum out of my mouth, and wrap it in paper, and throw it in the wastebasket. I didn't really care. I always had another package of bubble gum right here in my shirt pocket. But my mom was the one who would really get mad because I would forget to take the bubble gum out of my pocket. I would throw my shirt with all the other dirty clothes. My mom would wash my shirt. Oh, you have to understand something. I grew up a long time ago. My mother had an old-fashioned ringer washing machine. There probably isn't anybody here except for my sister who has seen a ringer on a washing machine. You might have seen one at a car wash over by the sink with two rollers and a crank on the side. You crank it around and the rollers start to spin and you put the rags in between those two rollers. They squeeze the water out. It's called a ringer because it wrings the water out. My mother's old washing machine had a ringer hooked up to the motor. It didn't spin the way washing machines do now. My mom had to take every piece of clothing and put it through the ringer on the washing machine. The rollers would squeeze the water out. She would put my shirt through the ringer and the rollers would squish the bubble gum right into the cloth. There would be a big gunky stain all around the pocket. And my mom would say, look at this. You ruined another shirt. But one day, something happened. It changed her mind. She didn't get mad at me anymore for keeping bubble gum in my shirt pocket. That's because one day, I was walking around out in the desert. I was chomping on some bubble gum. I was daydreaming. I wasn't paying any attention to where I was going. And I stepped right on a rattlesnake's tail. Well, the snake couldn't rattle and warn me because I was standing on his tail. He didn't worry about giving a warning. He came striking up through the air. He was aiming his fangs right at my heart. The rattlesnake hit me right here. That's where I had some bubble gum in my shirt pocket. And the rattlesnake's fangs stuck in the bubble gum. There I was with my foot on a rattlesnake's tail and his fangs stuck here in my shirt pocket. He was thrashing around and whipping up against me. I was so scared I couldn't move. I just stood there looking down into his beady little eyes. Those little eyes were looking hate right back at me. That snake was working his jaws up and down. He was trying to get his fangs out of the bubble gum so that he could get back at me and he could really bite me good. But of course, as the snake was working his jaws around, trying to get his fangs out of the bubble gum, the bubble gum kept getting softer and softer and softer. And then the next thing I knew, there was a little pink bubble coming out of the rattlesnake's mouth. The bubble kept getting bigger and bigger. It got to be about this size. I took a deep breath. I got up all my courage. I brought my hand up and pop! I popped the bubble and the snake went flying over backwards. His head hit on a rock and it knocked him out cold. 
but it did take all my courage. I fainted. I fell out in the other direction. I didn't come home for lunch. My mom came looking for me. My mom found me lying there on the ground. I was fainted out cold. And lying in the other direction, she saw a rattlesnake with bubble gum all over his face. My mom asked me what had happened. And I told my mother the same thing I just told to you. You know what? My mom didn't believe that story. <laughs> Did you? No. Thank you so much. This has been really fun. It's about all the time we have. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. You were great. Sometimes when I tell stories back where I live in Santa Fe, when I finish up, some kids will even come and shake my hand, and that always makes me feel good. So if any of you kids are handshakers and you like to come and shake hands, that, that'll make me feel really happy. Maybe some of you will. Want to come and shake my hand? Oh. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.